Hello, my name is David Esdell. I am the Council's Environmental Sustainability Officer. I sit within our Sustainable Development Team and our main role is helping the Council deliver on its climate change commitments and improving uh, energy reduction use, uh, not just in the Council but across the borough as well. So just before I go into the tool and do a demonstration of the tool, I just want to set the scene a little bit, give a bit of background information about what the Council has been doing on climate change and trying to reduce its own emissions and trying to engage with partners across the borough to do the same across Tower Hamlets. So what is the Council doing to reduce its carbon emissions? Well, some of you may be aware, some of you may not, that back in March of 2019, the Council was amongst one of the first in the country to declare a climate emergency which after that point a vast majority of councils have now done likewise. Uh, the council at that declaration committed to becoming net zero carbon by 2025 and that is among one of the most ambitious targets in the country. A lot of councils have aimed for 2030 but uh, cabinet and full council at Tower Hamlets decided that we should try and do this by 2025 because it is an emergency. And by net zero carbon what we mean is to try and reduce our emissions as much as we possibly can and that will leave a residual amount of emissions and at that point we will offset those emissions but it's very much about reducing as much as possible first before we look at any offset and from the work we've done we believe we can reduce emissions by 75 percent so that's a real big challenge and work still going on with that and i'll share in a minute how how we're trying to do that but alongside that we also know that the council is only responsible for two percent of all of tower hamlet's emissions so the council can become net zero but we need to work with partners and stakeholders across the whole borough to make Tower Hamlets net zero as well. At the time of the declaration, we aim to do that by 2050. But since then, we've done some work and we've engaged with stakeholders and different organisations. And we now believe that actually we should be aiming for 2045 to do that. We believe that's a realistic target. And we're now working on that with lots of various partners across the borough to help achieve that and working with the community as well. So since the declaration, the Council has published an action plan on how it's going to reduce its own emissions that's split into these five sections. So with our buildings, we're proactively at the moment carrying out retrofit projects to our buildings. We're currently in some of our larger buildings replacing boilers with air source heat pumps. We're in the early stages of looking at how we can install solar panels on some of our buildings and general retrofits and improving lighting systems and the like. And also some of you may be aware that the council is going to be moving to the new town hall in Whitechapel later this year and we've been working with that team as that build's been progressing to make sure the building or the heritage building and is difficult in some areas is as sustainable as it possibly can be. We've also looked at our procurement and all of the products and services the council purchases and we've engaged the procurement team who are now going to be engaging with any current or potential suppliers on their sustainability as a business to ensure that their values align with the council's and that will now become part of any procurement bidding process. In terms of power, the council does purchase renewable and energy, but we know that's not enough just to have a green tariff. We need to look at generating our own electricity and reducing our own use. In terms of waste, uh, before the pandemic, we were removing single use clubs from all our buildings and trying to look at other ways of improving waste collection and recycling. It's kind of obviously taken a pause as most of us are working from home at the moment, but as we return to the office, we'll pick that up again. And probably the final area is the biggest challenge for the council is around transport. The council has a large fleet of various kinds of vehicles and trying to switch all those vehicles to electric is going to be a real challenge, but it's something we're starting to work on and where there are suitable alternatives, we're starting to create a plan of how to do that. So that's what the council's doing. I say alongside that, we've been working across the borough with a partnership to create a partnership action plan of how we can reduce emissions across all of Tower Hamlets. That was published back in December and we're now looking at creating programmes to support that partnership over the next year to start in, um, acting out some of those actions. But whilst that's been happening, the Council have had its own programmes. We've been supporting residents that are most vulnerable. We've replacing boilers to make them more efficient. We've provided grants to schools. That photo there is of Morpeth School, and we provided a grant to help them towards the purchase of solar panels. And we've provided SME support over the last three years through grants to help SMEs carry out retrofit projects such as lighting, heating, and in some cases installing solar panels as well. So that's kind of what we've been doing up to now. And what we felt is, is that instead of just always giving out grants, we want to provide more support that helps organisations across the borough be able to measure their own emissions, identify the areas themselves that they know they need to tackle, 
so that they can then go out and get the support or carry out the projects they need to. So for this reason, we've created the carbon footprint tool. So um, I think everyone was sent the link to the tool before this event, but if not, it is available on the council's uh, website. If you um, that buy that link, or if you just go to the council's homepage and type in carbon footprint tool in the search box, it will bring you to this page and this link will open up the tool for you. So in terms of the tool, it's there to help you as much as you can record the data you have to allow you to uh, calculate the emissions that your organisation has generated over the last 12 months. So the first uh, page will just be an introduction. It just explains what the tool's about, how to use it and what it can help you do. And this first page just allows you to record some basic information so that when you come back to it at a later date, you can refresh yourself on what you've done. So on this first page, to start with, always record the year you're reporting for. Now, typically, um, greenhouse gas emissions are reported either over a calendar year or a financial year, but that doesn't stop you from reporting between any two points in a year if that's when you want to do it or when you have data for. It's just that tends to be the general best practice. Um, so, for example, the council reports over a financial year each year. So this first tab allows you to select the dates for which you are reporting for. So just for this example, let's say we're doing it for all of 2021. And then there's some other information you can put here. And we've put this information in here because one of the things that we'd like to come out of this is that if you do complete the tool, we'd be really grateful if you could share it with us, not because we want to put it out there or share it with anyone else. It's just to a, allow us to see if the tool's working, if it's fit for purpose. And it'd be really good to start getting an understanding of emission levels of different organisations so that we can target support appropriately in future to help you reduce your emissions down the line. So that gives you the option to do that here. And something I'd always do is just put in the number of employees you have at that point in, because if your organisation grows in the future and you employ more employees, your missions are likely to increase as well. So if you know how many employees you had at each point, you can do a calculation where you divide the number of employees by your carbon emissions, and that will give you a ratio per employee, and it will allow you to make a direct comparison between each year as your business grows. So it's always worth uh, doing that. And I do the same for the council each year as the council grows or contracts. So we can see if in staff levels are making any difference on our emissions. So into the tool itself. The tool is split into five different sections of five different areas that are responsible mainly for generating emissions within an organisation. I've colour coded each one just to make it a bit easier to look at and to differentiate. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to create a hypothetical um, exercise with some hypothetical numbers just to show you how it works and talk through where you'd find this information and how you can put it in. So the first section is on buildings and power and quite simply this is just about the energy you use in your buildings so your gas and electricity and for this section all that is needed is how much gas and how much electricity have you consumed over the last 12 months. Now you should be able to get this quite easily from your utility bills some utility providers provide an annual statement, or if you have an online portal, you might be able to go on there and just get that number. If not, it'll just be a matter of getting the last 12 bills out, getting a calculator out and just adding all the numbers up. And every bill will tell you exactly how many kilowatt hours of gas and electricity you've used in that period. And quite simply, you just add it up for the year and put those numbers into the spreadsheet. So for example, if I just put in some numbers here, so if this hypothetical business, I've Put in they've used 50,000 kilowatts of gas and 80,000 kilowatts of electricity and as you can see as you put that in the tool calculate the carbon emissions related to that for you it's, it's as simple as that hopefully if you happen to have solar panels on your roof or are generating renewable energy in some other way the spreadsheet also allows you just to recall that there so you can keep a record year on year and that when you report your emissions you can also report that figure to show that you are generating as well so that option is there for you. So that first section is probably the simplest one. It's just a matter of going to your bills, finding out the totals and putting them in. The next section is around transport, which can be a little bit more um, complex. So the, here we're just looking at any emissions from tr um, transport use associated to your business. So you, you may be a business that have your own vehicles, such as vans, for example, or you may be a business where your employees travel to meetings using their own cars and claim back mileage, for example. 
Now, as you can see on this section, it's split into two. You can either record this by mileage or you can record it by the amount of fuel you've actually purchased. The most accurate way of doing this is by putting in the fuel consumption because we know exactly how much carbon burning a litre of diesel produces, for example. But if you don't have that data, it doesn't matter. You can just put in mileage or you could do a mixture of the two. If you have some of the mileage data and you have some fuel consumption data, you can do a mixture of the two, but just make sure you're not double counting because your emissions will come out higher than they should be. So I'll take you from the mileage section first. As you can see, it's split into different categories of vehicle. And just for each section, you just need to add up the total mileage associated to your operational use for those vehicles. So for example, if you have in your organization four diesel class two vans, you just need to add up the mileage from those four vans and put that number into that box and it will calculate the emissions for you. And then, for example, you may have employees that go to events or meetings in their own cars and claim back the mileage. And say, for example, they all have medium petrol cars and a total they claimed a thousand miles back. You just put that thousand miles in and it will calculate it for you. So it's just a matter of going through each category for the vehicles you have, adding up the total and putting the number in. So that's one way of doing it. If you happen to have records of how much fuel you've purchased, you may have that from receipts or if you have fuel cards, you should probably have this data. Quite simply, just finding out how much you've purchased in the last 12 months, which will be in litres, putting that number in and it calculates the emissions for you. Um, so that should come receipts. In terms of mileage, uh, you may record that. If you don't record your mileage for whatever reason, when your vehicle is going for an MOT each year, obviously they take the mileage at your MOT, so you'll be able to compare that to the mileage from the previous MOT. And as they're annually and normally within a few weeks of the same time last year, you could just use that number to put in. So that's the transport section. Next, we move on to refrigerants. This is a little bit more complex. This is something you're not going to know by just looking at whatever system air conditioning or fridge system you have to be able to calculate. So with refrigerants, the emissions from refrigerants being used is actually higher than using energy or from transport emissions because the global warming potential, as we call it, from some certain uh, emissions of refrigerant are quite a lot higher. So it's important that we record this because in some organisations, this can be actually the highest area of emissions. So what we suggest for this section is that if you have any equipment that uses refrigerants serviced or maintained annually at that service or maintenance, you may be told that you need to purchase more refrigerants to put into the system, at which point you'll know how much you've purchased. And then you can just put that figure into this spreadsheet. So, for example, say our air conditioning has been just been serviced, we've been told we need to purchase a bit more of this R410A. We can put that number in and it will calculate it for us. So this is something that you might not have any data on. Don't worry if you don't, it's a section you can just leave blank. But if you happen to have this information, I would really suggest putting it in because it's something to keep a good record of. But compared to, you know, I'd always just make sure you've got your energy and your transport data in there as a must. And then as these other sections go on, you may not have data, just fill in what you can because it's better to have something than nothing. So that's refrigerants. The next section is water. Now, the carbon emissions associated with water aren't relatively as high as all these other sections, but with water, it's not only just about recording this here to look at your carbon emissions, but it's also tracking your water usage over time. Uh, with climate change, the projections are as the century progresses, we're going to get warmer and drier summers, the droughts may increase, and that water scarcity may become more of an issue in London and the southeast. So it's a really good thing to keep recording your water use and trying to see what you can do to use water more sustainably in your organisation. So for this section, again, just like with your energy bills, it's just a matter of going to your water billing, looking at how much water you've been charged for over the last 12 months, entering that figure, and the same should apply with your sewage, you should be charged for a figure. If you aren't given an actual figure for whatever reason, they normally charge you around 90% of your supply. So you can put those two figures in. And as you can see from the spreadsheet, it's calculated emissions. You can see immediately that the emissions from water are significantly lower than other areas on the spreadsheet. But as I say, it's not just about the carbon emissions here. It's actually about just tracking year on year your water usage and trying to do what you can to reduce that over time. 
And the final section of the tool looks at all the material wastes that your organisation produces. Now, hopefully you may be able to get this data and information from whoever collects your waste, so they provide records of how much they've collected and how much you're being charged. So if you are, it should be relatively straightforward. You can go to that and fill it in. If you don't, that's not a problem. There's another way we can do this and it works on more of an assumption and calculations. But as I said earlier, it's better to put something in than nothing. So what I've done is I've done a little bit of research on how you can do this if you don't have records of how much waste you have produced over a year. So what I've done is I've based this on a typical big wheelie bin that a lot of commercial uh, entities have and you normally type find them in blocks of flats as well. For example, the big wheelie bins, they're 1,100 litre bins. And from that, you can get about 65 kilograms of your general black bag waste in those and you can get about 35 kilograms of mixed recycling in those bins. And from knowing that information, what we can do is that if you record every time you fill a bin and it gets collected, we can then just calculate an assumed weight of waste you produced over a year. So, for example, if over the course of a year you have filled your wheelie bin with general waste, two wheelie bins a week, and you do that over 52 weeks a year, it's just a matter of doing two times 65 kilograms for one week, times that out by 52, and that comes out at 6.76 tonnes. And it gives you then an idea of how many emissions are responsible for that waste that you've sent to landfall for your black bag wastes. And we can do the same for recycling. So, for example, in this hypothetical situation, this organisation produces two wheelie bins a week of paper and cardboard that gets collected for recycling. So, again, that's 35 kilograms a bin, 70 kilograms a week for the two bins, times it by 52, that's 3.64 tonnes of waste. And again, the spreadsheet will work out the emissions of carbon dioxide associated with that. And you can see quite clearly that you know, recycling emissions are going to be far lower than landfill incineration emissions. And then you can just do that for each of these categories. You know, if you have a dedicated glass bin, you know how much weight it is for every bin, you can do the same thing. And likewise for food or garden waste and for all the others. So yes, yeah, so if you haven't got direct records of the exact amount of waste you produce, there are ways of getting around that and doing it to get an, a, an estimate so that you can actually look at some emissions from that. So that's the tool that, that is hopefully as straightforward and simple as that with the data input. And I appreciate that the first time you do this, it might be a bit more complex and difficult because you've got to find where this data is and put it in for the first time. But hopefully once you've done it once and you return to it each year, it becomes an easier exercise to do. So once you've put in all the data, you can see down the bottom here of the tool, it generates a summary table that provides all the total emissions for each area and gives you a grand total. And it also produced this pie chart for you so you can see which sections are responsible for the most emissions. And quite typically, in most organisations, it will be buildings that produce the highest amount and then transport will be after that, depending on the nature of business. So if you're someone there's lots of deliveries, you may find out that the transport gets bigger. But these are normally the two biggest areas that are responsible for emissions. So it just allows you visually quickly to identify that in this case, that buildings and transport are the biggest emitters. So they're the areas to look at first to try and reduce emissions to help reduce your carbon footprint. So once you've inputted your data, this will be created. What we've put in the tool to assist you is a tab that will create a summary greenhouse gas report for you. Now, lots of bigger organisations and the council, for example, produce a greenhouse gas report each year and we publish that on our website. So you may want to share with your customers or your clients your greenhouse gas emissions each year to show that you're trying to be as sustainable as possible and that you're being transparent about your emissions and what you're trying to do about them. So we've created this tool here that will just automatically from the tool enter all the emissions that you put in. So it's there ready for you to use. You haven't got to do anything. You can just copy and paste it and put it wherever you would like to put it. So I'll just explain um, how the report is set out. When emissions are reported, they're reported in different scopes in different areas, and there are three of those. The first one, scope one, is all about direct emissions. And quite simply, that's basically where you're burning a fuel on site and it's resulting in emission. So that will be for gas consumption because the gas burns in your boiler in your building. 
it will be for transport because obviously the fuels in your vehicle in the engine being combusted and emitting an exhaust. And these fugitive emissions here, these are the refrigerants, they're known as fugitive emissions. So that's the refrigerants because they're emitting on site as well. So that's scope one, and that'll be all your direct emissions. Scope two is known as indirect energy emissions. That's just basically electricity. Although you consume the electricity on site, it's generated in a power station somewhere else, and the emissions are being emitted from that power station. So although you're responsible for that because you consume the electricity, the emissions aren't actually coming out of your site. So that goes into scope two. And the final section is scope three, which is basically any other indirect emission. And you know, some big organisations, they will report lots of different parts of their business where there are indirect emissions. And it's almost, it's something that can almost go on forever once you start. But for the tool and for these purposes, we try to keep it as simple as possible and trying to keep it to the areas that have the biggest impact, which in this case are water and material use. See, so the, these have been split into the different scopes. You have it for each scope and then it has a grand total at the bottom. And I say you might want to share this with customers or clients, but you may find that if, for example, your organisation bids for contracts or, you know, you're looking to work with the council uh, when we're doing a procurement exercise and I say going forward, the council is going to be looking to ensure that organisations are doing something about their carbon emissions. You can use this report to evidence that you're recording your emissions and you're using that to do something about your emissions. And that may put you ahead of com other competitors going for the same contract. So this could help you with that kind of thing. So we've recorded our emissions, we've reported our emissions, now we need to do something about it. Now I could do a week long workshop on every single area of an organisation where you could reduce your emissions and all the different projects and things you could do. And um, that's obviously not the purpose of this tool, but what we have done on this final tab is we just tried to put in a few little tips and pointers of some what we call low hanging fruit of things that might have quite a big impact quite quickly there are no costs, low cost, and there's some things on here that would require a bit more investment, but things you may want to consider in the longer term if you've kind of exhausted all the other uh, no cost and low cost options. Again, this advice and information is split into the different sections in the same colour coding as the tool. And I'll just briefly go through each section just to highlight some of the things that you could be looking at doing. So around buildings and reducing your energy consumption, around heating, just always ensure you're getting your boiler service annually because it'll run more efficiently. Just making sure that you've got uh, heating controls, that the heating's coming on as needed and you're not heating a building all weekend or out of hours when there's nobody in the building. If you're in a situation where you're finding staff are using portable heaters, even though you have a central heating system, firstly, they're electric, which is more expensive, especially at the moment with prices going through the roof. They're more high consuming, so it's doubly worse. But that should tell you there's something wrong with your heating system in your building and the solution isn't everyone having a portable heater it's fixing the heating system and actually in the long term it might be better to invest in fixing that than constantly paying for staff to plug in electric heaters all the time so it's just looking at things like that and heating is always a massive contentious issues in workplaces because everybody has different comfort levels but it's about finding the best solution you can for the majority because you're never going to please everyone and i've had many experiences of this across the council as well and you know, just simple things like looking at windows and doors are shut and you're not letting drafts through. I appreciate in the COVID world we live in at the moment, there's best practice about fresh air coming into buildings that might not apply much at the moment. But if you're having to let fresh air into your building, make sure then that your heating's not on constantly because your heat's just escaping out. Maybe think about having the heating on in bursts or programming it in a different way that balances the need for fresh air to come in but while trying to heat the area as well. And with lighting, uh, the, the, the simplest way of reducing energy use from lighting is to upgrade it to LED. That can be expensive depending on the size of your building and you may not have the funds to do that at the moment. So if you can't do that at the moment, just look, look at the simple things of you know, turning lights off if you don't need them. Or in some ways, instead of having to try and always turn them off, look at installing sensors. If there are parts of your building such as storerooms or toilets, look at putting motion sensors in. So they only come on when someone walks into the room and 30 seconds after they've left it will turn off again. And it's just you know, the simple things about just making sure you're turning off machinery, equipment, computers at the end of the day and out of hours, because over one day it might not much make much difference, but over a year, cumulatively, it'll make a real difference. And some more specialist things at the bottom there that if you have refrigeration equipment, make sure the seals are all get tight. Uh, if you work in a shop and you have open fridges, consider maybe getting a screen or putting doors on fridges. A lot of supermarkets 
are moving to that method now of having all their fridges with doors on because they realise they're just using a ridiculous amount of energy trying to keep fridges cold with all the cold air escaping. So there's just a few pointers there on what you can do in your buildings to look at that. Uh, transport. Two ways you can look at look at how your employees are travelling to and from their prem your premises and also looking at how you operate as a business with transport. So if staff are able to walk or cycle to work, trying to encourage that. It's obviously not impossible for everyone, depending on where they live. And um, if they live further away, encourage the use of public transport, especially in a borough like Tower Hamlets, where driving can be uh, difficult at times and parking especially so. And then in terms of your own business, if you have a fleet of vehicles, so for example, in the tool that hypothetical business had for diesel vans, look at seeing ways, can you switch those to electric? And then what I'm not saying here is that, you know, tomorrow go out and buy an electric van to replace a diesel one. You might not have the funds to at the moment. That might not be possible because you need to put the charging infrastructure in. But what I'm saying is that if you have a lease arrangement or you've got a vehicle that you know you're going to need to replace in the next two or three years, at that point, consider all the different options that are out there and see if electric at that point is feasible for you to switch to an electric vehicle to replace that vehicle. And that can you know, make a huge difference to your emissions. And there is support out there to help you with this kind of thing. There is the Zero Emissions Network, which Tower Hamlets is part of alongside Islington Hackney. And this is a support program that can help businesses switch from diesel and petrol vehicles to other alternatives that are low emissions. So example, they can help support you purchase cargo bikes. So if you do a lot of um, deliveries close to your premises, instead of getting in a van and doing it, they can help you get a cargo bike to do that instead. And they've already helped 22 businesses across the borough do this. And what they also do is they offer free trials. So you haven't got to jump straight in and make that commitment. They'll allow you to trial one out for a period of time so you can see if that's an option for your business. So I believe the link to them has been put in the chat and if that's something that you think might be really useful i really encourage you to get in contact with them and they'll be able to provide you with that support so that's on transport um with refrigerants again this is not something you're really going to be able to do yourselves this will obviously require someone to come in when they maintain or service whatever system you have to that uses refrigerants but it's just looking about you know if you've got a really old system that's using refrigerants, there are probably some harmful ones in there. Is there a way they can be substituted for other ones? Is it possible you're in a position to actually replace that system with something that preferably doesn't use refrigerants, or if it does, that use less and less harmful ones? And if not, it's just making sure they're maintained and serviced annually so that any leaks can be dealt with and that it's running efficiently and using as little refrigerant as possible. And when the system does get to end of life, just ensuring that however it's disposed it's done in a responsible way by someone that's got the accreditation to dispose of refrigerants so that it doesn't cause any harm to the environment but again this is something you're probably not going to be able to do yourselves it's something that's going to have to come in and do that for you um with water oh sorry let's that back up uh, with water it's pretty you nice know, this is pretty obvious what we can do with water so i won't labor the point too much it's just trying to be as sustainable as possible um if you've got places like basins and toilets, for example, maybe look at putting low flow plumbing fixtures in because you don't need a full open tap to wash your hands. Or, you know, a low flow fixture might reduce that and you still be able to effectively wash your hands, for example. And just obvious things around, you know, if you have leaks, just making sure you're dealing with them as soon as possible. And probably around this area, it's about having the conversation with your staff, um, maybe engaging with customers about just trying to reduce water usage as best you can. Because I said, this is possibly an issue that has the century progresses and may become more pressing in this part of the world. And the final uh, bit of tip there is that if you have a location that's suitable for this and you're able to do so, look at harvesting rainwater. And if you're able to get a water butt and you put it able to put it under your drain pipe and collect water, I don't know, for example, if you're a florist and you obviously need water for your flowers and everything, that might be a way of sustainably sourcing your water rather than having to run the tap. And it'll be cheaper as well because you won't be charged for harvesting rainwater as you are with your water supplier. So just, just some simple tips there. And the final section on materials and waste. Again, pretty obvious about trying to reduce waste. What is used is generally a waste hierarchy to help try and reduce waste. And that goes through different levels of trying to minimise waste as much as possible. So the first level that hierarchy is prevent if you cannot generate the waste in the first place, that's obviously the ideal situation. If there's a way about going to task or an exercise that doesn't involve any waste, obviously try and do that option. If not, try and reduce the waste that you produce as much as you possibly can. Um, 
uh, just a random example that popped to my head earlier is that when I go do my food shopping and I buy some loose veg, for example, I don't put it in a bag to then put my trolley to put in another bag. And buy some carrots can go straight in the basket because there's a skin naturally on the carrot to protect them and it can go to a bag. So I've reduced and prevented waste that way. So it's just a, a very simple, basic example, but it's, a, it's along those kind of lines. So trying to prevent the waste, reduce the waste. If you do generate some waste, can you reuse it for another purpose? So things like bottles and containers, that type of stuff. There might be some bigger examples out there. You know, when you get bubble wrap in packaging, can you repurpose that for a different thing if you um, post out things that are fragile yourself, for example? So try and reuse waste. And then the next level down is that if you try to do all those options and you've got to dispose of the waste, first ensuring that you're recycling everything you possibly can. And if unfortunately you can't recycle it for whatever reason, that it's not possible to recycle it, then obviously it'll end up in the general waste. But it's just about going through all those different options first to try and reduce your waste as much as possible. So as I say, they're just some very high level, basic, um, simple tips that a lot of are hopefully low cost or no cost things that you could do straight away to reduce your emissions and some other things that you could do that might require a bit more investment. As well as, you know, there's always support from us at the council to help provide and point you in the right direction. But there are other organisations out there with a lot more expertise as well that could help you. There's the Energy Saving Trust and the Carbon Trust, for example. Uh, both their websites have dedicated sections for businesses to look at different areas of how you can reduce emissions in your business. And again, in a similar vein, they'll set up low and no cost measures and some that might require a bit more investment. Sometimes they hold events and workshops that you can attend and they'll be very good at signposting you and providing the level of support you may need if you're really looking at reducing your emissions. So I'd always advise looking at their resources on their websites as well. Alongside that, so some grant support available from the council at the moment that can link into this topic. So if you know you carry out this exercise and you've identified areas that you would like to reduce your emissions, there's the business adaptation grant available that could possibly help with that. And that is a program where the council's partnered with Enterprise Nation to deliver a program of business support and funding up to £1,250 in match funding. Uh, as you can see there, it's up to any business with fewer than 10 employees who are trading in Tower Hamlets before the 30th of June last year. And it will help you adapt your business to the post-COVID environment that we now find ourselves in and help you safeguard for the future uh, as well. So the example being provided here that if you're a restaurant or cafe, for example, as a result of the pandemic, a lot more customers may feel happier sitting outside rather than inside. So you need to create an outdoor seating area. Obviously, this time of year it's cold, so customers would expect some form of heating in that area. So the gap adaptation grant could help you create that seating area but also help you do that sustainably. So if you need to produce, uh, purchase heaters, looking at could you put a solar panel on your roof that then powers that heater and then all the products that you're buying for that um, seating area being from sustainable sources. It could possibly be from secondhand sources and repurposing something. And that's a very sustainable way of doing it. So that's just an example of um, what the grant could do to help you with. And I believe a link for that will be put in the chat as well. And colleagues from uh, the business enterprise team are on the cause well to answer any questions on that. So thank you for listening to me. I've been talking for about half an hour now, so thank you all for listening to me. And um, as I said, we'd love feedback on the tool. So if you do go and use it, please do send whatever you fill in to us. Let us know if you've had it easy to use, if it's fit for purpose, if there's any changes you think should be made to it. And likewise, if you know, if you don't get around to doing this for another month or so and you have any questions or can't remember anything, do feel free to contact us on that email address there. Uh, that comes to our team and one of us will pick it up and we'll be more than happy to help you. Um, so yeah, so if there's any questions, I'm happy to take those and thank you for listening.